This is going to be about the downfall of pride. You think back all the way throughout the Bible, you see the main thing that people get into that's their downfall, it's their pride. All the way back before man was even made, you got Lucifer swelled up in pride. You look back on Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, really popular verses explaining Lucifer and his problem. And it says, how art thou fallen from heaven? What was it that caused Lucifer to fall from heaven? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did its weaken the nations? Cut down to the ground. Somebody like Lucifer is fallen and cut down to the ground. And here's why. Isaiah 14, 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, who was in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Notice all those I wills. Five I wills. You can tell when somebody's talking that they're very, very full of themselves and all about themselves and it's all about them. And that's the way it was for Lucifer. I will, I will, over and over. It was all about him. But look at verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit, if you want to go up, you need to come down. You got to decrease so the Lord can increase. But then at the same time, when you do that, he'll increase you. The devil didn't do that. He increased himself and God decreases him. He ends up falling, cut down to the ground, brought down to hell is where he's going to be. He's going to go to the bottomless pit one day. Then one day he's going to go to the lake of fire. And what was his problem? Pride. Ezekiel 28, 16 and 17. It says, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee, out of, cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Here's why. Because thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. His heart was lifted up because of his beauty. The more that you have going for you, whether it be looks, talent, any gifts you've got, your fame, your wealth, whatever it may be, you have to watch it. Your heart can get lifted up in that. Uh, a very nice looking person has more of a temptation for the heart to get lifted up because of their beauty. Maybe you know somebody that's like that very beautiful person and they think that they're better than everybody else. And you look down on them for that. Well, I wouldn't so much look down on them for that because if you had that much beauty, you might end up being lifted up and having your nose stuck up in the air. Because the more you have going for you, the more temptation there's going to be to get lifted up. And Job 41, 34, describing the devil as Leviathan, Lucifer, Satan is also Leviathan. Job 41, 34. It says, He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. King over all the children of pride. You're never more like the devil than when you're prideful. He's the father of lies, yeah. He's very evil all the way around, yeah. But he's king over all the children of pride. You really got to watch your pride. 
if you examine yourself, you're going to find out that you get prideful and you don't even realize it. You got to watch out for the sin of pride. God wants you humble. And if you're not humble, God might end up making you humble. So the first one we see that's full of pride is Lucifer. From the beginning. But then you think about somebody like Eve. And maybe you never saw Eve as being very prideful, but she is. In Genesis 3, 5 through 6, she's approached by the king of the children of pride. And in Genesis 3, 5 through 6, the serpent, the devil himself, says to her, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see how he appeals to her trying to get her to want something that she doesn't have, trying to get her to want this knowledge and be as gods. He even says, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, you know, trying to cast some, some, a bad look on God here and says, your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In her pride, she would want that this extra knowledge. So verse 6 says, and when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So Eve, she wanted to be better than God had originally made her. She was coveting some knowledge and knowledge puffeth up, as Paul says. But did it make her better or worse? It made her worse. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2, Paul says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. You got a lot of people that are puffed up in their knowledge. They are ever learning. And they may know a lot of facts, but they can't even get along with anybody else. They got the most brains in the world, but all their knowledge and their facts does for them is makes it impossible for them to get along with anybody else. And he, th he thinks that he knows everything. He's a very prideful person. You can't train him. You can't teach him. You can't reason with him. He thinks he's got a better way on everything. He thinks he knows better than you on everything. Maybe you got 30 years of experience on something. And he's got two months experience on it. He thinks that he knows more than you. He's a very prideful person. If any man think he knoweth anything... He knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Or you use the Bible, for example. You think you know a whole lot of Bible and you're a Bible genius. You know nothing yet as you ought to know. The more you learn about the Bible, the more you realize you don't know any of it. But Eve, her sin was just like everybody else's sin. In 1 John 2.16 for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. She had the lust of the flesh going on, the lust of the eyes. She saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes. There's your lust of the eyes. She saw that the tree was good for food. There's the lust of the flesh. She saw that the tree was desired to make one wise. There's the pride of life. You saw it with Lucifer. You saw it with Eve. But what about Cain? Adam and Eve's son, Cain. You know the story of Cain and Abel? Back there in Genesis 4, 3 through 5. 
It says, And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. You see, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. Not an acceptable sacrifice because God demands a blood sacrifice and you can't get blood out of a turnip as they say. But he was happy with Abel's sacrifice. He brought of the first things of his flock a bloody animal sacrifice. When he, when uh, Cain found out that God wasn't happy with his sacrifice, with his offering, he was mad. You can tell people are prideful when they get mad, when they're critiqued, they get jealous of somebody that does better than them, and they think they got a better way. Cain would have knew he should have brought a bloody animal sacrifice, but he thought he had a better way than the Lord's way. And Cain was wroth and his countenance fell. You know, he's like a person who thinks that they're getting to heaven. They're getting salvation. They're going to be in the millennial kingdom. They're going to be in New Jerusalem by their own goodness, by their own works, by their own fruits. Uh, and if Cain was here today, he would be a fruit inspector, most likely. He tried to get in God's goodness by his own fruit of the ground. You got a lot of people going around and they're so prideful. They think that they're, you can't get saved unless you have a certain amount of good fruits. They think you can't say, another people think you can't be saved unless you got a certain amount of good fruits. You got people that think you can't, there's no way that you're saved unless you got the same fruit that they've got. And if you ain't got the same fruit that they got, then uh, you really didn't get saved. But that's not true. It's not about my fruit. It's about that I come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and put my faith in his blood, his shed blood, and what he did, what he brought to the table. That's what it's about. It's not about anything I've done, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It's not about my fruits. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. And his countenance fell. Man, you can see pride in people's countenance. And we've all got a, at least a little bit of a pride problem. Some people more than others. And in Psalm 10, 4, it says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. You know, Cain had still had an opportunity to get things right after this. But you look at his countenance. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. They got too much pride to do it. If you've talked to people about the Lord very much, you've met people plenty of times that will, will not, they will not, they will not admit they're a sinner. They will not do it. I talked to a lady on the phone and you could not get her to admit that she was a sinner. I talked to another kid at work. You could not get him to admit that he was a sinner. Plenty of times, if you talk to people about the Lord or the Bible very much, you're gonna you come across people that you can say, "Have you ever told a lie?" They'll try to justify it. Have you ever looked on a woman to lust after her? They'll try to justify it. They'll never own up to the fact they got too much pride to admit that they're a sinner. And if you can't admit you're a sinner, 
then you're not going to admit that you need salvation. But what happened with Cain? He was driven away. Away from his parents. A murderer. A fugitive and a vagabond. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. So you got Lucifer, you got Eve, you got Cain. And then you get over into Genesis 6, you got those giants. Imagine being born a giant among men. And I don't just mean like Shaq, I mean way bigger than that. I don't just mean like Yao Ming, I mean way bigger than that. And that's the way it was back there in Genesis 6.1. It says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. You know, these uh, sons of God came down. The angels, you can imagine they're very prideful also, just like their king over them, Lucifer himself, and they're just taking any wife that they choose back there. And you think about that, you're, this, you're a person walking around today, and you can get any woman you want. You can get any man you want. You get very prideful of that, probably like those angels, those sons of God did. Very prideful. They left the God of heaven and forfeited eternity with him to come down here. And it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. You see, those sons of God took on flesh to come down here. And it says, Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And it says, There were giants in the earth in those days, the offspring of those sons of God and, the, and daughters of men produced. It was giants. And you imagine how prideful those giants were. Giants in the earth in those days and also after that. And we know that they're prideful because it says also after that, that too was inhabiting the land while Israel was in Egypt and getting out of Egypt. And that's who they had to go up against. A bunch of wicked giants full of pride, full of sin. The abominations of the heathen, it calls it. Very prideful. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown, mighty men, men of renown, giants, very puffed up. They got their nose stuck up in the air, literally, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I mean, they're not just head and shoulders above every person like Saul. They're knees and the rest of the body above every person. Imagine how puffed up you would be and how you would make everyone just feel so inferior to you if you were like that. It would be easy to get puffed up, to get lifted up in your pride, being a giant, walking around. You can pick up something that nobody can pick up. You look at down at those regular men like they're nothing. And maybe, like I said, maybe you've got some type of talent, ability, strength, and the devil is using that trait that you have to make you just so lifted up and full of pride. And you're becoming one of the, the king of the children of pride. You're becoming his right-hand man. You're so lifted up in your pride. And you, what you need to do is start taking that talent, ability, strength, whatever it is you have, and using it for the Lord. Or you're just going to be driven further and further away from God, like those giants. You go a few chapters over, and you see the Tower of Babel, Genesis eleven three through 4. Look at what they say. And they said one to another, 
Go to let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So you see, it's all about we, us. Look how many times it says us. Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Well, that's what exactly what God wanted them to do was to separate and to scatter, be fruitful and multiply the earth. But they all got together. And the thing is, when people, a whole bunch of people get together, they get a whole lot of pride. They start thinking that they're hot stuff. They start thinking that nobody can take them down. They start thinking that it's about numbers and not about God. And they said, let us make us a name. They wanted to make a name for themselves. You get to thinking about that when you start feeling like you want to make a name for yourselves to where you're going to be some type of legend or something like that. It's going to lead to a whole lot of pride. You'd be better off to just humbly go through life, do the best you can, working for God, and whatever He allows to happen, that's what happens. Don't worry about making yourself a name. Exalt His name, and then He's probably going to make something out of your name, too. Uh, I mean, a good name is to be chosen more than great riches, but your purpose of doing anything shouldn't be to make yourself a name but that's what they did at the tower of babel they got together a big ecumenical movement and that's what people want to do today they get together and that's what's going to happen under the antichrist they're going to get together and it's all going to be against the lord jesus christ and they're going to gather together against him at the battle of armageddon and they're going to think, they're actually going to think that they can win. You see over there in Revelation, uh, where at the end of the millennium, when the devil's loose from the bottomless pit, he gets an army as the sand of the sea. So many. They're going to actually think, because they got all these people, that they can take on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look through the scriptures. You see Gideon's 300. You see Asa taking out that million-man army. You see David's mighty men, one man taking on 800 guys, 300 guys. It's not about numbers. It's about the Lord. It's not about you. It's not about your strength. It's about the Lord's strength. But the Tower of Babel, they had serious pride problems there. Then you get over to Sodom in Genesis 19. But you know what it says about Sodom and other places? In Isaiah 3, 9, it says, The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. So the show of their countenance doth witness against them. You can tell by the look on their face that they're full of pride. You can tell by the look on their face that they're not ashamed of their sin at all. They declare their sin as Sodom. You look at some of these athletes and the look on their face is just, they're just eat up with pride. Especially in the NBA, you watch them come through those tunnels or you watch the f uh, professional fighters come through those tunnels with that music playing. Just a bunch of pride fests is all that is. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. Ezekiel 16, 49 says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. You see, it wasn't just homosexuality. It says pride, fullness of bread and abundance of idleness. It was pride. A, a sin connected with sodomy is pride. The devil wants to make you think that you should be proud 
of who you are. Be proud that you are involved in this lifestyle and have a pride parade. Be proud to come out of the closet and all this stuff. But that's, I mean, you wouldn't sell an adulterer. You wouldn't celebrate an adulterer, a man who cheated on his wife and had, and have parades for adulterers, right? You wouldn't have parades for people that commit bestiality, right? You wouldn't have parades for people committing incest. You wouldn't have parades for people that are pedophiles, a pedophile pride parade, right? So why would you have a sodomite pride parade? They're full of pride. That was one of the sins of Sodom. Jeremiah eight twelve. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. The downfall of pride, you see. They couldn't even blush. They're not, they're not ashamed of this abomination. Those sodomites were out in the open, beating down Lot's door, trying to get the two men, the two angels that came in there, unashamed, unashamed no shamed. They were out in public doing this. Ezra 9, 6 says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee. That's the attitude you should have. He said, My God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trans trespass is grown up unto the heavens. That's the attitude you want. He said, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee. You know, Paul said, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? You should be ashamed of the things that you did, the sinful things that you did before you were saved and after you were saved. There's some things that I did before I was saved, and I think back about them, and I'm, I'm thinking, I hope nobody remembers that. God doesn't remember it. He's not applying it to my record. It's done and over with. It's forgotten. But I, sit, I think I hope nobody remembers how bad I was before I got saved. And I hope some people don't remember the thing, some of the things I've done after I've got saved because I'm ashamed. You need to be ashamed. Admit that you're wrong. Admit that you've done wrong. That's Sodom. A really bad pride problem with Sodom. You still see it today. Homosexuals, a really bad pride problem. They're raised to think they should be proud of it. Then you see Goliath over there in 1 Samuel 17. In 1 Samuel 17, 8, it says, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and saith unto them, why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him, and kill him, then shall ye be our servants, and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man, that we may fight together. Look at how he talks. He said, if he be able to fight with me, he said, choose you a man for you. He's down there taunting them. He doesn't think that anybody can take him down. He said, I defy the armies of Israel. Um, this man was standing there defying the Lord's people. And he would have known their past, how the Lord's helped them, how the Lord brought them through the Red Sea. He would have heard about it. He would have heard about all those stories. But yet he was still so full of pride. And look what happens to Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 49 through 51. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith and the Philistine. And when the Philistine saw their champion was dead, they fled. One second he was thinking he was the man. Nobody could take him on. He was defying the, the armies of Israel. He was defying God's people. He was defying the God of heaven. 
The next minute, his head's chopped off. That's a good illustration of where pride will lead you. You'd be better off to just be humble and whatever battle you're about to face, say that you can't do it on your own. You need God's help. Don't go into it thinking that you're the best and nobody can take you on because you need God's help. This ends with Goliath falling on his face. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Same thing happened with Saul. King Saul, in 1 Samuel 15, 17, Samuel says to him, he says, When thou wast little in thine own sight, which thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. When he was little in his own sight. God wants to use people that are little in their own sight. Saul got a big head. He was head and shoulders above everybody else, and he got the big head. He was still too afraid to take on Goliath, but he still thought that he was something special. But you see what happened to him at the end of 1 Samuel. He falls down on his own sword. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You see it all the time. You see it with athletes thinking they're so special, so full of themselves, always celebrating. When they score a touchdown, they're always celebrating. When they get a, a knockout, always celebrating. Slam dunk, always celebrating. Well, why is it that when they get around 30-something years old, they have to retire and they're just done? If you're so special, how come you can't really hardly compete no more after you're 30-something years old? You see it in about every sport, basketball, football. Well, if you're so good, how come you still can't play after you're 30-something years old? I mean, that's pretty young. you got a lot of life left. You know, the average guy at a fact working at a factory, he's working up there in his 60s and 70s, and I've worked with some people in their 80s still lifting heavy stuff every day, heavy pallets every day. And But you're so special, yet you're, you're done after 30-something years old. And they're so full of pride, and it's like, People look up to these people and worship them as gods. It makes them even more prideful. But think about it for a minute. You look at these athletes, say a professional basketball player. You know, other than practice and stuff, a game is what, 48 minutes long? 48 minutes long. That's it. He doesn't play the whole 48 minutes. The whole 48 minutes isn't just consistently one minute after the other they got timeouts they got a half time somebody got to shoot some free throws you sometimes you're on defense just kind of standing there I mean that's that's nothing and people are looking up to them or that Taylor Swift concert stuff that's going on everybody's like three she's it's three hours long, and she's doing this continuously for three hours long. How does she have that, that much energy? And I'm thinking, well, hello, you got that much energy. You work a job every single day, sometimes working 14, 15, 16 hours. And do you not work for three hours straight? Why do we look up to these people? When, honestly, they should be looking up to the average factory worker that gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning every day and makes nothing and gets no praise for it whatsoever. But instead, they're looking up to brats. And it's got uh, the celebrities' heads are full of pride. The athletes' heads are full of pride. So your kids are all looking up to people that are full of pride and they get that same countenance on their face. You can see it on a lot of young people. They're copying a countenance that they've seen on somebody else, a face full of pride. You think about this other guy named Sennacherib in Isaiah 10. 
Look at what he says. This guy is a big time narcissist. It really reminds me of what the devil said. It says in Isaiah 10, 12 through 15, Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. He's got a stout heart. And the glory of his high looks. He's got his nose stuck up in the air. For he, look at what he says. For he saith, by the strength of my hand have I done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. And I have removed the bounds of the people. And have robbed their treasures. And I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth the eggs that are left. And I gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. Look at all that. I, me, my. That's all he's saying. Talking about himself. I and me and my. Watch out for these people that when they write something or when they're talking, it's I, I, me, my. And that's it. That's all they talk about is themselves. Tooting their own horn. Defending themselves. This is a man full of pride. Full of himself. But look what the Lord says to him. Shall the axe boast itself against him that he heweth therewith? Sennacherib's just the axe. The Lord's the one slinging the axe. It says, or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? Sennacherib's just the saw. The Lord is the one using the saw. As if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up. Sennacherib's the rod. The Lord's the one lifting up the rod. Or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. Sennacherib is just the staff that can't lift up itself. It's the Lord that's made him powerful so that he can use him to bring judgment on Israel. Sennacherib did nothing. And you need to realize that you're nothing. If it wasn't for God, you couldn't even get out of bed. If it wasn't for God, you couldn't breathe, you couldn't walk, you couldn't talk. I mean, there's all kinds of blind people. It's only because of God that you can see. He could have made you blind. He could have made you deaf. He could have made you paralyzed. You're nothing. You're only moving and existing because of God. Why do you got pride? Then you think about Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel 4, 29 through 33, look what he says. It says, at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, it's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. What a proud thing to say. And it says, While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. He's making sure that Nebuchadnezzar knows who's the big dog, who's the Most High here, not Nebuchadnezzar. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Talk about going down. It says in Psalm 12, 3, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Proverbs eleven two: When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 18, 12, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Before you're going to be destroyed, you're haughty, you're proud. Pride goes before destruction. But before you get honor, you're humble. Get humble, you'll get honor. And Nebuchadnezzar had to hit rock bottom before he came to his senses, Daniel 4, 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar got right with the Lord, and he realized that he wasn't hot stuff. You think about the Antichrist himself, 
In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Man, he's getting cut down to the ground. Proverbs 29, 23, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. The Antichrist, who deceives the masses, proud enough to walk in there and claim to be God, he's getting tossed into a lake of fire. The devil's getting tossed into a bottomless pit and then the lake of fire. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall.